I believe that we are live in Aitorah, Bogartov. Good morning. Morning. Shavuot Tov, Kahel Kadosh. Today, Monday, the tenth day of Adar One, corresponding to the nineteenth day of uh, February 2024. Today's class, graciously sponsored by Yaakov Kovi Cohen for the Refua Shelema of Dana, but Tova, Makadosh Baruchu, give it a Refua among the Halim of Am Israel as well. Additionally, today's class dedicated by Eli and Rivka Levi, Le'ilu Nishmat, his beloved father, Yosef Ben Sarah Halevi. Uh, we have a few minutes to learn together before we get ready for the ladies' classes at 11. Let's get moving a bit. Perashat Tetzaveh, as we know, the beginning of Perashat Tetzaveh deals with the topic of the Kohen Gadol. Basically, the concept of the Begadim, the concept of the garments, but interesting enough, we have seen through Perashat Tetzaveh that Moshe Rabbeinu's name is missing. The Pasuk writes, Beata Tetzaveh, Beata Hakerem Elecha, all these Pesukim, Beasita, Beata Tedaber, omit the name of Moshe Rabbeinu. And I believe that if we ask the audience, why is the name of Moshe Rabbeinu omitted from today's Perashat, we know the answer that Moshe Rabbeinu in next week's Torah portion in Perashah Kitisa, when the Torah describes the unfortunate event of the Egel, of the sin of the golden calf. So Moshe Rabbeinu interceding on behalf of the Jewish people. The Pasuk tells us that Moshe Rabbeinu made a comment to a Kadosh Baruch Hu. What was the comment? But Moshe Rabbeinu, listening to how Akadosh Baruch Hu was unhappy, was very uh, sad, and even disappointed at the behavior of the Jewish people, and I'm using just words that we can relate to as humans. The Pasuk writes that Moshe Rabbeinu, seeing all of the above, he says to the Almighty, Meheni na. In English means erase my name from the Sefer Torah. The Gemara, I believe, in Masechet Makot says, Kelala Shel Hacham, Afilu Al Tenai Ba'a. What does it mean? It means that when a curse comes out of the person's mouth, especially of the mouth of Talmidei Hachamim. Even though it's conditional, it has the power of becoming activated. Now, what exactly this particular Gemara teaches us? So I like to say that the Hiddush of the Gemara today is that even though Moshe Rabbeinu said what he said to Akadosh Baruch Hu without any malicious intent. At the end of the day, what was Moshe Rabbeinu looking to achieve? Forgiveness for the Jewish people. Imagine yourself, God is saying, you know what, Moshe? I had it with these people. I'm going to wipe them out and start a new nation with you without headaches without troublemakers. This is basically what God wanted to do. So the Moshe Rabbeinu statement to Akadosh Baruch Hu was conditional, was for the sake of protecting the Jewish people. So the Gemara teaches us that even though the intentions of Moshe Rabbeinu were holy and pure, still Moshe Rabbeinu acted in a way that the Torah did not approve. And this is not easy to say. Unbelievable. I'm only saying it because the Torah says it. It's not easy. Moshe Rabbeinu. But we need to remember one thing. 
when Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us, he's not teaching us only what to do. But Moshe Rabbeinu is teaching us also what not to do. Which is an unbelievable lesson that the Torah is teaching us. Now, with that being said, God says, you told me to erase your name. You know what? I'm going to erase your name. And that's the reason why in Perashat Tetzaveh, Moshe's name is not mentioned directly. It is hinted throughout the Perashat, but it's not mentioned like we have seen in all other Perashiot. Whenever there is a commandment in the Torah, the Torah mentions the name of Moshe Rabbeinu. By the Ben Hashem and Moshe Lemon, Kadeshni Kol Bechor, Zavet Bene Israel. Always we find a commandment and the name of Moshe Rabbeinu is attached. Because at the end of the day, why Moshe Rabbeinu was called Moshe Rabbeinu? Because he was our teacher. That's why he was called Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, but the Gemara utilizes, and the Torah actually utilizes often situations to teach us lessons in Abodat Hashem. So lesson that we can learn from this uh, opening statement of today's class is that a person should train themselves never to curse. Now, I ask you a question. What curse did Moshe Rabbeinu said? What did Moshe Rabbeinu said? Erase my name from the Torah. Is that a curse? Usually, when we talk about a curse, we usually understand immediately vulgarity, profanity, foul language, yani talking in a way that is beneath the dignity of a Yehudi. But what did Moshe Rabbeinu say? Erase my name. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Guess what the Gemara says? The moment that Moshe Rabbeinu brought something negative from his mouth <coughs> is a curse. God forbid. So imagine yourself. If something negative, the Gemara labels it a curse. That's the language of the Gemara. You understand Hebrew? Kelala. What's the meaning of Kelala? Curse. curse. That's exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu said. Ah, he didn't curse? Sure, for our vocabulary, he did not curse. But the moment that he says, erase my name, it was considered a strike, so to speak. Like Rahel, like, like Rivka, like Sarah. Sarah uh, mentions an interesting pasuk when it came, yeah, Abraham and Sarah were talking and arguing about Hagar. And what did Sarah say? Stand a Ishpot Hashem Beni Ubenecha. She summoned God to be the judge between them. And guess what? If there is one thing that we don't do, don't summon God to be the judge. If you summon Hashem to be the judge, you're activating judgment against you. And that's why her life was shortened. Because she summoned God. Sometimes, in different languages, people say different things. In Spanish, there is a sentence that says, eh, que Dios te lo pague. Means, may God pay you. But that, it makes a difference. How do you say it? If you say it in a positive statement, in a good scenario, you did something good, and the person is saying thank you to you, telling you, Yani, may Hashem reward you, that's a beracha. But if a person says, que Dios te lo pague, right? You understand Spanish? Yes. You understand? Portuguese. Well, Portuguese también. Okay? Que Dios te lo pague. That's not a positive statement. 
that you're telling the person, may God strike you. That's the connotation of that statement in Spanish. Now, I think that it's imperative that we remind ourselves something that we have learned many, many months ago in the beginning of Sefer Bereshit that the Zora Kadosh writes certain things that a person should avoid to have a better life. And the Zohar says, Hamekalel et atzmo Bekol shiken aherim The Zohar says, one thing that you must avoid at all costs is cursing yourself. Don't curse yourself. Sometimes people in the moment of anger or disappointment, frustration. They, frustration, thank you, professor, may come and they say things about themselves. And the Zohar Kadosh says that that's not good neither. That's not good neither. Says, but you know what is worse, says the Zohar, when we curse another person. Now, with that being said, and obviously, the Torah always the Zohar, in this case, sees things from a different perspective. I gave you the superficial concept why the name of Moshe is not mentioned. You know what the Zohar says concerning whatever we said? That actually, that in this particular case, that the name of Moshe Rabbeinu is omitted. The Zohar Kadosh says here at the bottom, and it says, "Ata, ata, ata." In the Hoshanot, what do we say? Oh, Hoshana. We say Hoshana. But what else do we say in the Hoshanot? Ani vahu hoshi anna. Ani vahu, meaning the person and a Kadosh Baruch Hu. So the Zohar Kadosh writes and it says that when the Pasuk writes Ve'ata hakrev elecha the Zohar says Ihud kutcha berichu uchshinte Bore Aulam is saying to Moshe Rabbeinu you and I I'm going to handle the situation. At the end of the day during the 40 years of leadership of Moshe Rabbeinu when the Torah at the end of Perasha Bezot Beracha, Sefer Devarim, the last Perasha, what or how, how the Torah calls Moshe Rabbeinu, Ish HaElokim, the godly person. What does it mean, the godly person? Either you are a person or you are godly. So short answer is, that every person can become godly. What does it mean? Irat Shammai. What does Irat Shammai mean? That a person brings God into their life. That's what it means. Remember when we mentioned on a Shabbat, when we spoke about the concept of the Terumah, correct? The concept of the donation. And we asked the question, why you have to go through that channel? Bring a check. And halas. You have to go to Home Depot to buy wood. You got to go to downtown Miami to buy fabric. You got to go to, to, to whatever to bring olive oil. Bring the money and halas. You want to buy a seat for the synagogue, right? Say amen. 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 Beautiful. Amen. Which one do you want? <laughs> Let me know. I got a good couple of good seats. And my suggestion is buy it now before we begin the renovation of the shoe. Buy them now. Don't wait. Because the way will be a different price. All right? So I give you a good deal for you. Anyways, I'm going to tell you, okay, call Saunders Company in Milwaukee and bring a chair from them. 
What do I say? You want a seat? Hazaku aluch, Misha Berach. I'll tell you how much is it. Depends on this, on the location, like the airplane. You know, you want front row, you want extra leg room. I'll sit. It's coming. Like Yankee Stadium. More or less. Like the Safra Sina. They have deals. What do you have to go to the Yankee Stadium? Stadium. Better than Yankee Stadium. Okay, that's Legends, it. Legends. Yeah. Sure, bleachers, second row, beseder. So why does the Torah say bring gold, silver, copper? Short answer. Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to handle the donation through the feelings of the heart. And the only one that can see the heart is a Kadosh Baruch Hu. That's what the Pasuk writes in the book of uh, Shemuel. When he came to the selection of the sons of uh, uh, Ishai, we learned this on Shabbat, that Shemuel is summoned by a Kadosh Baruch Hu, and he says to him, I have two missions for you, only two things. Go tell Shaul, not you. Your name is Shaul Yonatan. So we keep you there. But go tell Shaul, Hamelech, that I don't want him as a king. And when you finish with that, go get me a new king. Go to the house of Ishai and uh, select a son. Put yourself for a moment in the shoes of Sh Shemuel and Navi. Think for a second. You know what it means? You tell the king of Israel, God doesn't like you anymore. I'm looking for a new king. And yet he did. There was fear. And Hashem says, don't worry. I'll protect you. And he did. And yet when it comes to select the sons of Ishai, everyone that Shemuel thought that was going to be a suitable candidate, God says, next, he ran out of sons. <coughs> Until finally, the baby. the baby was missing, playing around outside, being a shepherd, and David was selected. But what Hashem says to Shemuel, the problem is, he had you're judging him to him. You're judging the book by its cover. But God sees the heart. And this is what the Gemara writes. And that's why the Perashat says, Only God knows the heart. No one else. That's why I learned the other day that uh, it's a pasuk actually, but we discussed in the past. Let nishbal benitke elokim lo tibze. The pasuk writes that when a person reaches out to a kadosh baruch Hu with a broken heart, it says Hashem is always available for that type of person. And actually, I, I heard. I, I think I saw it in writing. Attributed, I think, to, I think, 98% that was in the name of Rebin Menachem of Kotsk. And it says, En davar shalem kelev shabur. You know what that means? En davar shalem, I will explain. En davar shalem kelev shabur. There is no more complete heart like a broken heart excellent question how could that be very simple because when a person reaches a level of being heartbroken this is the emet of the heart it's deep it's a very deep for us we think the opposite the great rabbi says the opposite sometimes could be how things by you, Baruch Hashem, everything is so beautiful. And inside you're eating the kishkes. You know what that means? Okay, you're eating your mahshi. Okay. Instead of fish kishkes. Friday night. Friday night. Okay, you can have the Yevra Shabbat morning. Okay? That's what it says. It says when a person comes to a Kadosh Baruch Hu, as David Amelech says, chapter 130 of Tehilim, Mima Amakim Kelati Hashem, I call you out. 
from the depths of my heart that is the best he says and that's why David Amelech adds one more and he says we mentioned this the other day you have all the sacrifices of the Beit HaMikdash on one scale on one side of the scale and your heart your heart is greater all the sacrifices for Kadosh Baruch Hu, Ruach Nishbara, a broken spirit. Because the person comes of the heart. So according to the Zohar Kadosh, it says, don't worry about Moshe's name missing. Because you know what God says to Moshe? Moshe, you and I are going to work together as a team. And we're going to take care of the next chapter of Jewish history, which is what? The appointment of the Kohen Gadol. Why? Because the Kohen Gadol remembers the tefillah of Yom Kippur, correct? Sedera Agoda. What was the highlight of Sedera Agoda? That the Kohen Gadol goes into the Kodesh HaKodashim, the Holy of Holies, inside of the Bet HaMikdash, and what does he do for the few moments that he will be inside? One thing, pray for the welfare of the entire Jewish nation. That was the goal of the Kohen Gadol. To pray on behalf, that's why if you look at the prayers, you'll see two things. Number one, the prayer very short. Number two, it was an all collective prayer. It included everything. Well-being, rain, livelihood, parenting, children, all inclusive. Nothing personal, nothing private. You can't give to the Kohen Gadol here, make a mishabera for the Fosh of a relative. No, you needed to go only for the benefit of Am Israel as a whole, very deep and very powerful message that the Zohar Kadosh uh, discusses in the introduction to Perashat Tetzaveh. A very short message from Sha'are uh, Kedusha. So, the Gemara in Masechet Megillah discusses a dialogue between two Hachamim. One was Rabbi Nehumiya Agadol, and the other one was Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Nehunia, if I recall correctly, he is responsible for composing certain prayers. One of them is the prayer before the person starts learning. In yeshivot, in kolelim, is very common that when the person starts learning, they say a prayer, and when they finish learning, they say another prayer. But this prayer is not a lengthy prayer. It's a prayer for success in learning that they should be able to learn the Torah in the proper way. It should not be mistakes or misunderstandings in the learning, etc. And then at the end, the person gives gratitude. Matchaf, sigue adelante. Matchaf. Okay? Thank you. To be grateful to Akadosh Baruch Hu for having the opportunity of learning Torah. This is Rabbi Nehunia. I believe that he also composed the famous prayer that's called as Anna Vechoa. Anna Vechoa, is attributed to him. So Rabbi Akiva asked the great rabbi, and it says, tell me in what merit in what zechut were you given the gift of longevity? Longevity. Now, you ask somebody, longevity, what was the merit? Most people will tell you, I walk the circle, I eat good, I no. sleep, say it's out. Okay, it's not Shrey, No. I know that, but that's why I'm talking and you're enjoying the breakfast. What circle? Okay, okay, okay. Driving people crazy, that's called walking the circle. <laughs> Okay? So many people will answer that. But let's see what the Hachamim answer in this merit 
of longevity. Number one, the rabbi says, easy. I never accepted gifts in my life. That's what Rabbi Nehunia said. I didn't say that. That's what he said. And he brings a pasuk that says, Vesone matano. Pasuk from Shalomu Melech. And it says, you, you, you hate gifts, you live longer. Why? Because you have no strength attached to anybody. You, you have nothing. But you can keep giving gifts. Okay? Relax. And I know, I know that. I know. It's a dig now. Velo amadli al midotai. And it says, I wasn't exacting on the way people interacted with me. I think if we read between the lines, the Bina Hunia says, the irrelevant of how people may have treated him, he never changed his well-being, his well-behavior. He treated people respectfully, something that we definitely uh, can emulate, etc. The Gemara goes further, and he brings another story. The Gemara tells us about Rabbi Nabal Yoshua Halash. He became very weak, that he was closer to Olam HaEmet than to life. Oh. Gemara says, and he came back. He had refuah shelema. He had tehiyat amadim. Amru lo, my hazita. You were there and you came back. How was your trip? You didn't go to Israel. You went to Olam HaEmet and they sent you back. They sent you back and you imagine they usually it's a one-way ticket. Is that a good thing? Maybe. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see what the rabbi is going to tell us. Now that he came back, we want to hear the news. It says, "My hazita, what did you see?" Amar lehu, Rabuna says, "Achi amar kadosh baruchu." They were discussing what to do with me. There was a debate in Shemaim, what to do with me. Mitatatin says. Hey, listen, he's already 90% gone. What's another 10%? Bring him. But Olam says, hold on a minute. Go check. And it says, Belomoki Milta. It says, see how did interacted with people throughout his lifetime. And the Gemara concluded, Lo takimu bahade. If he acted properly, send him back. And he was sent back. Comes the Gemara further. And it brings a third story. Don't be afraid of this one. Okay? You should. <laughs> Amru Rabotenu Zal. Rab Nehman Hafar Tel Ehad. Rab Nehman from the Gemara was digging a hole in the ground. Be'ayar Rabahabar Yoshiyahu Kabul Sham. And Rabahabar Yoshiyahu was buried. Be'ra'ahu Kayam Be'atzmotam. And he saw that his body was intact. Now, the burials back then are not like the burials of today. That is, sometimes they have the, the liner in Florida, certain cemeteries, by law, you must use a liner. The box. In the, outside of the box. Why? Because there is water around, water underneath. In order to protect the remains, they have to put that. And it says, Amar le Maihai. It says, I don't understand. You have been gone from the world for many, many years. How come your body, it looks fresh, intact? Amar le Rabaha answers to Rabbi Nehman, Mi amai lo amati al midotai, ve lo tafasti belibi kin at haverai. It says, I never overreacted and I never <coughs> enabled envy 
or jealousy to enter my heart. That's very difficult. And we are here to learn and to try. Nobody said that it's easy. I'll be the first one to say it's not easy. But the Torah is teaching us, you know, what should be our goal in life. <coughs> to just, you know, to be, that's the way I am. Is not a good statement in Judaism. If that statement is for goodness, for charity, kindness, compassion, hazaku baruch. But if we say that to justify some type of reaction, may not be ideal. And again, does that mean that we're going to switch after one class? I hope it's so easy. But definitely is an eye-opener that the Torah is telling us what to do. Lo amati al midotai means that I did not have reactions in an adverse <coughs> manner. Let's say somebody got upset by what somebody said. Now, how can you react? There are many ways of how to react. Option number one will be not to react. Ignore that's hard. Of course, and Rahi, we agree that it's hard. Nobody's saying easy. It's, nobody's saying it's easy. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of discipline and the goodwill to change. Okay? But at least we know what's expected from us. Now, where do we learn that not having jealousy or envy in our heart protects the body afterwards. Shilamu HaMelech urkava asamot kin'a. The rattening of the bones is, called, is caused by jealousy. Now, Lachen, um, he says, Ani shelo aita bi kin'a en atzmotai markibim is because my life was not full of envy or jealousy, my body remained intact. Now, the question is, what's the connection between jealousy and the decaying of the body? So, Haintovim, I can attempt to give a suggestion. I only give suggestions. <coughs> Then you do what you think it's right. Now, why there is jealousy? Or why people desire what they don't have? And before you answer... Human nature. No. Wait. It's not human nature. Because human nature should be that we have a munayna kadosh baruchu. If I have a munayna kadosh baruchu, why should I be jealous? The Tenth Commandment is telling me, don't covet don't desire. If you need it, you will have it. If you don't have it, because you don't need it. This is a principle of emuna. Ah, now suddenly I'm having jealousy. Maybe the yeserara is tickling our neshama. But on the other hand, envy or jealousy is not visible. Nobody knows of that. So where does that feeling stay? Inside the body. Once the person leaves the world, that jealousy accumulated needs to leave. How does it leave? Through the bonds of the person. And it's the bonds. You ever heard? You know, it's eating... It's eating me inside. Eating How many people? Okay. How they say? I'm eating my kishkes. Okay, kishkes. <laughs> you know, go to Samastan. You can buy the freezer. They have kishkes. They are part of kishkes. But kishkes by itself is not good. It needs to be cooked inside the chocolate. You never ate chocolate? I chocolate. I ate kishkes. Ah, you should try it, but not too much. Now we're eating kishkes. 
I hope my wife is not listening now. She <laughs> said, why did you speak about Cholent and Kishke? Do you want me to make it for the Shabbat? Maybe Shankhatra will do it. Okay, let's continue. One more. Gemara, Ma'aseh Beribi Eliezer. One time the Gemara tells us there was a drought in the land of Israel. When there is no rain, there are special prayers. So now you need to have a special prayer. Who are you going to invite? Rabbi Eliezer. That was the Rosh Yeshiva. Then Rabbi Eliezer goes to pray. No change. Next, who are you going to invite? Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva prays. He says, Avino Malkeno, suddenly starts the rain. Everybody was happy with one exception. The wife of Rabbi Eliezer. She says, he's a student. And you're the hacham. What people are going to say? That he's greater than you? Says Rabbi Eliezer. And it says, you know why Akadosh Baruch Hu answers the prayers of Rabbi Akiva faster than mine? Shall the Bia Akiva Ma'avir al Midotam Beyoter? The Bia Akiva was a super easy going person. What's the difference between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Akiva? Short answer. Rabbi El Azar or Rabbi Eliezer was a Rosh Hashiva. He was the chief rabbi of Israel in the time of the Talmud after Rabbi Yohanan was removed from that position. Remember, Rabbi Yohanan made an announcement, and it says, Kol It says, Rabbi Yohanan, new rule in the yeshiva. If your irat shamayim does not match your external look, don't, don't come to learn. How many people came to learn the next day? No one. Zero. When Hachamim saw this, they said to the Bio Hanan, go to Florida. <laughs> go retire. <laughs> he didn't go to Florida, but basically they told him, Hazako Baruch, Hacham, we need somebody next to come. Who do they bring? The Bili Eza. Who was a young fellow. And he says, whoever wants to come, fat. What happened? They ran out of place. They occupied all the seats. We have to put extra chairs, tables, bleachers. Like he said before, there was no room to walk around. So Rabbi Eliezer was a Rosh Yeshiva. And that position comes with certain requirements and certain strength of discipline. Because you are the Rosh Yeshiva, so you need to have is a cue run your company, your business. Don't you have discipline in your business? If you don't have discipline, how can you run your business? It's like synagogues. If we don't have protocols and disciplines, then it becomes hefker. But Rabbi Akiva, because of who he was, because of his age, because of his background, he learned to ignore all comments. And learning to ignore and to move on and to be flexible and to be easygoing, maybe in our earth is considered like a certain level of weakness. In Shamayim is considered a great person. A great person. This was the Zahud of Rabbi Nehemiah Gadol. This was the Zahud of Rabbi Akiva. This was the Zahud of Rabbi Yoshiyahu that we uh, mentioned, and this was the Zahud of Rabuna. Can you imagine? He's about to leave the world. They call him the Hebra Kadisha. They said, no, no, cancel the call. He made a U-turn. Shabbat says, you were nice, we are nice. That's basically, and that's why the Torah, when he's to illustrate illustrate the essence of Moshe Rabbeinu, what does it say? Be'aish Moshe anav me'od. You can only be easygoing and learn how to ignore and let it go when you have some humility. 
if you don't have, if I don't have humility, anything someone comments, anyone someone says, I'm going to be bouncing back. Why? Because you touch my pride. And that's why God says, individuals that are very proud, and I'm not telling you not to be proud of being a Jew. Right? Being proud of being a Yehudi is great. Being proud of your family, wife, children, descendants, has baruch. But if that pride is connected to holiness, so then that's when the attitudes and the comments and the reactions and the short fuse and the anger becomes activated because guaranteed that someone that has a deficiency in Ga'ava most likely has an issue with anger. Because they feed from each other. But anava, humility, it's the antidote of anger. If you want more details, read the letter of the Nachmanides. What is the first thing the Nachmanides says? Rule number one. When you speak to people, Nahat. Nahat means what? Calmly. Calmly, relaxed, respectful. How often? Every time. To whom? To every person. And what's the benefit? Immediately. What does it say? And when you act that way, you will spare yourself from anger that is the worst enemy of the, the person. And when you are spurred from anger, what's going to flourish? Humility. That is the best midah of the person. So the man says it very easy. It's not so easy to follow because it requires a lot of internal work. But at least we have the formula to be uh, successful in our Avodat Hashem, not only in our a godly relationship, which is obviously a key part of our life, but something which is equally important, Ben Adam La Havero, as well, in our interpersonal a relationship, and as the Gemara writes, you start from your home, your marriage, your parenting, and you walk around your circle, and by Ezat Hashem, the person has siyata dishmaya, the person has heavenly assistance to become the, the best that a person can be. Because what you see is not the real me. What I see is not the real you. I only see a sample. As the years go by and the person works in all matters, especially the ones that we discuss, then we have an upgraded product. And that's what the Gemara writes in the concept of marriage. Ish beisha zahu. What's the meaning of the word zahu? I mentioned this maybe a month ago. No, Hazakobalu. That was your Pirush. Hacham, aka you and K, or no, says they married them. You know what's the true meaning of that Gemara? They polished themselves. Zahu means also to purify. Shemen Zaid Zach. It's Pirasha. You, you shape, you polish yourself. Yani, you polish yourself, she polishes herself, because at the end of the day, marriage is a two-way street. So what God says, you polish yourselves, I'm moving to live with you. I'm holding your hands. That's what the Gemara says, Ish beisha zahu. Husband and wife, they purify themselves. And when I see purification, I'm not only talking about family purity, that's a given. Family purity attracts godliness. But that Gemara also talks about the concept of self-improvement in their behavior, in their personality, in their attitude. God says, I'm moving in with you. Why? Because there is shalom in the home. And God wants peace. The ultimate blessing, as we discussed in the past, in the past is the concept of uh, shalom. So my dear friends, I have a busy day ahead of me. We'll have the ladies' classes in an hour, so to speak, via itorah.com. 
for the rest of the male audience. We'll see you Shavu HaTov. Have a great day. We'll see you in the afternoon by Ezzat Hashem. Baruch Adonai Le'Aulam. Amen. 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 Amen